thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, yeah, what I'm going to say is not terribly modest. I hope it won't be taken as more arrogance coming from across the pond, um, which no doubt all of us have heard a fair amount about. Um, I'm going to talk about a mechanism which I think explains not only chronic fatigue syndrome or, multi or ME, I guess I should say, uh, but the whole group of illnesses that are associated with it and, and quite possibly quite a number of other diseases. And uh, we call it the, uh, the no oh no cycle. Uh, and that was a name that was suggested to me by one of my readers. Uh, and uh, based on the structure of nitric oxide and peroxy nitrite, but also based on the notion that no oh no is what many of you feel. So there are a large number of research groups who propose that uh, CFSME, fibromyalgia, multiple chemical sensitivity, and in some cases post-traumatic stress disorder have multiple overlaps and may share a common etiology or cause. They have uh, many overlapping symptoms. Many people are diagnosed as having more than one, that is, they tend to be comorbid. And cases of each of them are commonly initiated by a short-term stressor and uh, leading in turn to chronic conditions. So this pattern of short-term stressor chronic condition occurs in all four and needs to be explained. Uh, Gulf War syndrome has elements of all four and I think can simply be explained as being some sort of a gamish of the four. So I've got uh, several quotes here. One of them is by Claudia Miller who talked about all four of these and asked, are we on the threshold of a new theory of disease? Buckwald and Garrity concluded that uh, CFSME, multiple chemical sensitivity fibromyalgia patients, despite their different diagnostic labels, uh, suggest, they suggest that these illnesses may be similar, uh, if not identical conditions. And uh, Danae and Zeem uh, made a similar statement that they may simply reflect different aspects of a common underlying medical condition. So we need explanations not just for one of these, but for all of them that are consistent with the data that's available with all of them. And what I'm going to present to you then is what I'm arguing is a major new paradigm of human disease, the nono cycle which I believe can explain all four of these and in fact uh, probably a number of other diseases as well. And uh, so this is, uh, there, there, there are nine well accepted paradigms um, previously accepted and so if this is correct then this is the tenth. And one thing I want to emphasize here is that um, what we're looking at here is what Kuhn called revolutionary science which is distinguished from the normal science, which is the kind of day-to-day -day, uh, science that people, that scientists do. Uh, and, uh, and one of the things I think that's very important to consider is that when you look at revolutionary science, uh, you're often dealing with it as an explanatory model. That is, you're not just looking at the data that's available, but more importantly, how well does it explain the many different puzzles that we have about these, uh, in, this, in this case, these illnesses. Uh, and so I'm going to be talking about it uh, very often as an explanatory model, not just in terms of, you know, what sorts of data are available. And it's not the point that the data is unimportant. Obviously, if the data is inconsistent uh, with a particular model, you throw the model out. But uh, it's, it's really as an explanatory model that uh, new paradigms are to a great extent either accepted or rejected. I think you already know this. People don't recover very often, so I'm going to skip through that. Uh, the biochemistry that's involved, actually this is real chemistry, um, involves this compound nitric oxide which reacts with another compound called superoxide to form peroxy nitrite, which is a potent oxidant. And this guy here is, is the most central uh, causal element in this, uh, in this cycle. And, uh, I, and so uh, we'll be talking about all three of these. These are all chemical compounds. Uh, and uh, peroxy nitrite being a potent oxidant can cause uh, many different types of biological damage. We're going to talk about some of them.
I mentioned before about short-term stressors that are reported or known to be involved in the initiation of these illnesses. And so in this table, I've listed a grand total of 13 different short-term stressors that, according to the literature involved in initiating cases of CFSME or MCS or FM or PTSD. And what you'll see here is, uh, first of all, they're very diverse. Um, they involve infection. They involve uh, psychological stress, exposure to a number of different toxicants, carbon monoxide, pesticides, organic solvents, in fact, multiple classes of pesticides, physical traumas involved, uh, even ionizing radiation uh, may be involved. And so we have these very diverse stressors. And one of the questions then is, you know, how can they act to initiate chronic illness? And what, what, is, what, what is striking, and I think is, is very important here, is that all 13 of these stressors can act to increase the levels of nitric oxide in the body. And I've argued that that's not likely to be coincidental. Rather, it's likely to be an important causal uh, element. And so then the question that we have to deal with is how can an increase in nitric oxide lead to the generation of chronic illness? And so this is my answer, and don't panic when you see it. Uh, this is uh, sort of an outline of what, what, what I've called, and, and let me just say this name was actually suggested by one of my readers. It's not uh, original, the no-no cycle. And, uh, and basically, uh, each of these arrows represent a mechanism by which one of these things can increase the levels of one of these other things. And, uh, and, and so, you know, basically, uh, what you'll see here is that you have a number of kind of interacting potential cycles, which, uh, and the idea basically is that once uh, proxynitrite, which is the most central compound is, is involved here, um, gets, gets uh, turned on, that at least it has the potential of starting this cycle. And once the cycle starts, it goes on of its own accord. And that's a very important concept because what we're saying here is that we have an initial cause, which is the stressor, which can act uh, usually through nitric oxide to increase proxy nitrite, and that once, once this gets elevated, uh, particularly if it's elevated chronic on this cycle, then the cycle is the cause of illness. And uh, the original stressor may be long gone at that point. And uh, so this is a vicious cycle mechanism, and I want to just kind of follow you through on, on a couple of these sequences here just to give you some feeling for what these different elements are, okay? So here we have proxy nitrite, which can increase oxidative stress because it's a potent oxidant. It also can act to increase levels of intracellular calcium. So this calcium over here is, is the level of calcium in the cytoplasm of cells. Um, both of these can activate a, a, a transcription factor. This is a protein which turns on certain genes called NF-kappa-B. Uh, NF-kappa-B, in turn, can activate the transcription of these genes over here. These are called inflammatory cytokines, so these are protein messengers that turn on inflammatory responses. They can also induce uh, this thing, INOS. This is a nitric oxide synthase. This is an enzyme that, that can uh, turn on the, the synthesis of nitric oxide. And so both directly and indirectly through the cytokines, NF-kappa-B can induce INOS, which in turn makes more nitric oxide, which in turn can react to form peroxynitrite. So you get some idea how these things can act in a cyclical fashion. Uh, the, there are two other nitric oxide synthases that are also involved, and uh, they involve, uh, these, are, these are both calcium activated, which is why calcium then turns these guys so they're more active, and they can produce um, more nitric oxide. Uh, there are multiple mechanisms by which superoxide can also uh, increase in levels in response. And, and let me just say, the, the mechanisms that are involved in these are discussed in, uh, in great detail in my book, which here's an advertisement here uh, explaining, quote, unexplained illnesses, which is supposed to be out in about a week and a half. Um, and, uh, and, and so, in general, uh, and there, there are two other 
elements in this that, that I want to discuss just very briefly. One of them is the vanilloid receptor, the other one's the NMDA receptor. Both of these are important, particularly in neuronal tissues. Um, they both have the property that they uh, allow calcium to flow in the cell and, uh, um, and, uh, and thus increase nitric oxide levels, and so that's what's going on here. And, uh, and so basically all of these are implicated in one or more of these illnesses. In some cases, they've been looked at just in, uh, in, uh, in, in a couple of them. In some cases, they've been looked at in all four. Uh, basically, where they've, been, where they've been looked at, they seem to be elevated in the chronic phase of illness. So one sees a, a good correlation. I'll talk to you a little bit about the specific observations on CFSME uh, in, in a minute or two. So uh, let me just say that these arrows, uh, there, there are a grand total of 22 different mechanisms that are, are, are basically diagrammed in here. Of those 22, 19 are very well accepted uh, biochemistry. That is, there's a lot of, uh, you know, very, you know, extensively documented biochemistry and physiology that's involved here. The other three are less well uh, documented, but even there I think we know a fair amount about what the likely mechanisms are, which of course strengthens the argument. So I think in general uh, the evidence for uh, these individual arrows is quite strong, and basically the only thing that I have done is to assume that they fit together in uh, what I'd say would be the obvious ways that you might assume they fit together. Okay, so there's, there's, not, there's not a lot of originality here, but as you've, I think, already seen, when you make that assumption, all kinds of things make sense that never made any sense before. There are a couple of things that were not obvious from that uh, previous diagram, however complex it seemed to be. Uh, one of them is that uh, proxy nitrite and to a lesser extent nitric oxide and superoxide can lower energy metabolism. They attack a number of things that are involved in the mitochondria uh, in producing energy in the form of ATP. And so mitochondrial dysfunction and uh, lack of energy then is a key feature of this cycle and in fact has important roles in some of those arrows that I showed you earlier. Okay. Uh, and the second thing is that proxy nitrite um, can oxidize a compound known as tetrahydrobiopterin, which is a cofactor for the nitric oxide synthesis. And it's not particularly obvious, but I think in fact this is an important part of the cycle. What happens when when this tetrahydrobiopterin levels are low because of proxy nitrite oxidation or for any other reason, is that the nitric oxide synthases become uncoupled. And what happens as a consequence of that is they start producing superoxide in place of nitric oxide. And so if you have partial uncoupling, you have some nitric oxide synthases producing nitric oxide, you have others that may be sitting right next to them producing superoxide, and those two can then react with each other to form peroxy nitrite. So one has, which in turn will then oxidize more of the tetrahydrobiopterin and maintain this partial uncoupling. Okay, so this, this may be a vicious cycle within the larger vicious cycle that I kind of outlined before, and I think this may in fact be a key feature, and I, I just in fact published a paper on this just, to, uh, just a few weeks ago. So there are five principles behind this um, this, uh, the no-no cycle as an explanatory model. And we've already talked about two of them. Uh, one is the short-term stressors can initiate these illnesses either by increasing nitric oxide or by raising other cycle elements. Uh, okay. And, uh, and second, the second thing that we've already discussed is that nitric oxide and proxy nitrite can initiate this no no cycle, which then is the cause of chronic illness, and the prediction then is, is that the cycle elements will be elevated in the chronic phase. And the symptoms and signs of illness uh, must be caused by elevated elements of the cycle, and those, uh, I've listed some of them here and you've already seen them. Uh, the fourth principle is a very important one, and that is that the basic biochemistry of this cycle is local. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that it's basically localized to certain tissues. 
And the reason for this is that, because, is that nitric oxide, superoxide, and proxynitrite, these three chemical compounds, have relatively short half-lives in biological tissue. So they don't go very far from where they're originally made to, uh, to where they're destroyed. And furthermore, the, the mechanisms of those arrows act at the cellular level. So we're talking about local mechanisms. And the consequence of that is that if you have different tissues impacted in different individuals, you're going to have all kinds of variations in the symptoms and signs of illness. And this, I think, is one of the most important features of this whole group of illnesses is we see stunning variability, both quantitative and qualitative, in the symptoms and signs of illness going from one patient to another to a third. I would submit that the only way you can explain that is through a local mechanism, and the only way in which you can uh, explain then how that local mechanism can be initiated by these short-term stressors is by some kind of vicious cycle mechanism. So I would argue simply, if not this cycle mechanism, what else? Um, so, uh, you know, let, uh, and so uh, let me just say, I'm not saying there are no systemic effects here, okay? What I am saying is that the primary mechanism is local. Okay, uh, the fifth principle is, is the most important one from the standpoint of both people who suffer from these illnesses and physicians who are trying to treat them, and it's simp and simply that therapy should focus on down-regulating the no no cycle. That is, we should be treating the cause, not the symptoms. There are, in, in my book, I talk about three types of generic evidence which uh, supports the existence of the no no cycle, and I think I better skip this because I'm running low on time. There is evidence for uh, quite a number of these elements uh, being elevated in CFSME in the literature. There's extensive evidence for oxidative stress that have been published by, I think, something like a dozen different research groups. Um, there's uh, fairly extensive evidence for mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, there's fairly extensive evidence that the inflammatory cytokines that I discussed are elevated uh, and so forth. So there, there's evidence for nitric oxide levels being elevated and so forth. So, so uh, uh, we, have, we have a number of these things that, uh, that we have evidence for. Some of them nobody's looked at in this. So, so for instance, the vanilloid receptor activity has been looked at in MCS and FM. It hasn't been looked at in CFS. So, it, you know, sometimes uh, people have looked at certain things and not at others. One of the things that you hear about a lot in the literature is that not only are these illnesses unexplained, but their symptoms are unexplained. And I challenge that here. And basically what I've done in my book is to go through quite a number of the symptoms and signs uh, and talk about proposed causes. Let me just say the causes here are well-documented causes in literature. By and large, these have not been studied to determine whether these are the causes in uh, CFSME or, for that matter, in these other illnesses. But there are known mechanisms by which, uh, the me by, by which uh, these particular um, <clears throat> aspects of the no no cycle can, in fact, generate uh, these mechanisms and, uh, and a number of others. And again, I don't really have time to go through this, but in my book I have a list of 12 different puzzles about this whole group of illnesses. As far as I can figure out, none of them were explained before. I can explain all 12. And uh, so as an explanatory model, I think this is really quite compelling. One of the things that is important here is that you know, as I said, the local nature of the no no cycle uh, predicts that those things that distinguish, say, a CFS ME case from a fibromyalgia case, from a, 
uh, multiple chemical sensitivity case and so forth, um, must involve some particular tissue or at least the function of some particular tissue. That is, the notion is that when that tissue is impacted, uh, whatever it is, uh, that people will then fit the diagnosis for CFSME. Uh, and, uh, and of course, some people, of course, fit the diagnosis for more than one, presumably because whatever tissues are involved in each are, are impacted. And uh, so the question is what, what is, what is the key thing about CFSME that makes it uh, distinct from, from the others? And, uh, and of course, uh, many people have proposed that the key uh, symptom is post-exertional malaise. And so the question that, that I raise here is, uh, is, is how can post-exertional malaise be generated uh, by the function of some particular tissue. And let me say, I don't know which tissue is involved here, but I do think I know what, what the function of it is. And, uh, and, and, I, I, and, and, and let me just say that the HPA axis dysfunction occurs with all of these illnesses. But there seems to be something different from at least a limited literature based on what's true with CFSME. And, uh, and, and, and this seems to be uh, the, the control of cortisol levels in response to exercise. Uh, okay. And I, I have to say, the, the evidence here is limited, so this has to be viewed as a, as a hypothesis. Um, and what, uh, I think we're running out of time here. Okay. Uh, two minutes. Okay. So basically, the argument is that uh, in people with CFSME, Cortisol levels, instead of going up in response to exercise, do not go up. In some cases, they actually go down. Um, and this, in turn, may exacerbate the no-no cycle because cortisol helps to keep the INOS from being induced, okay? So there may be an increased level of nitric oxide and, therefore, an increased activity of the cycle, and that may, in turn, exacerbate the whole spectrum of symptoms. That's the hypothesis. I just want to say in my book, uh, I talk about 30 different types of agents which are predicted to downregulate different aspects of the known cycle biochemistry. And the cycle is very complex. It's not easy to downregulate the whole thing. But uh, many of these can downregulate one or more aspects of it. And what I also talk about are the protocols that have been developed by five different physicians that involve at least 14 agents which, of, uh, of this list of 30 uh, that are predicted to downregulate the biochemistry. I think that complex combinations, particularly of nutritional supplements that are, are predicted to downregulate different aspects of it, that that is the most attractive approach to therapy. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Um